So hello, my name is Tama O Nakahara. Uh, I run a developer experience at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, hopefully you're here because you're a regular attendee of our Tuesday Weave online user group where we have speakers from our company Weaveworks or from our uh, extended container and Kubernetes community. So for example, today we're very fortunate to have Adrian Mua as our, contain, um, our speaker who comes from Container Solutions and he'll be talking about advanced techniques for building container images. Uh, if, this is, if this is your first time attending, then welcome to the Weave Online User Group and uh, we'll be showing you later future talks that we have. Um, Stacy is on the line as well. She's our community manager for this user group and uh, she's pretty much gotten most of her calendar filled up for the rest of the year. So we have a lot of great talks uh, this month and for the following months through the holidays. So thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I'll do a quick little intro. Uh, like I said, I, we are from the company Weaveworks. We're a startup based in San Francisco, London, New York, Berlin, and Denver, and distributed teams. And we've been getting more and more offices, so there's more cities to list. And uh, if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our CEO and CTO are the creators of the technology and the company around RabbitMQ. They sold the company to VMware and we were there for a while and then uh, found more needs within the container and uh, eventually the Kubernetes space uh, and created projects and products in the area that then uh, became incorporated into a company called Weaveworks. We are VC funded um, by a variety of VCs, including Excel Partners. Uh, another one is Google Ventures, which I mentioned because that's relevant to our dedication for the last several years in the Kubernetes space. I'll explain a little bit more about that. So a lot of our company is founded on open source. Uh, some of you may have heard us from WeaveNet, which was our earliest project, and still today is one of the premier ways to network your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have Cortex, which is now in the CNCF, and that is built on Prometheus, um, but makes it scalable and um, uh, more extendable. Uh, we also have Flux that Kurt most recently joined the CNCF as a sandbox project and that offers automated deployments or um, you might have now heard the term GitOps, which we coined uh, and that's one of the core projects that kind of led to this uh, concept of GitOps for Kubernetes. Uh, and then we have Weave Scope, which um, has observability and visibility. You get real-time uh, view of your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have plenty more open source projects, um, but I'll highlight one recent, most recent one that's gotten a lot of attention, which is Flagger, uh, and that provides progressive delivery, uh, aka like a Canary, Blue Green, AB deployments uh, for service meshes, and actually in some cases you can use it without service meshes. Uh, so that's sort of a lot of the background of what we work on and how we've been dedicated in the Kubernetes space, either contributing directly or building these projects that build upon uh, needs within the Kubernetes space. So as part of that, we also do have products. Uh, Weave Cloud is our longest product. We've had that for several years now, and it is a SaaS product that helps you manage your Kubernetes clusters, do automated deployments, as well as monitoring. So it brings all those elements together so that you could set up, for example, automated deployments or progressive delivery using the metrics that get pulled from um, the monitoring section. Uh, and the underlying parts of that are the things that I mentioned here, like Prometheus, Cortex, Scope, and Flux. So in a way, it's hosted, um, it's a hosted version of those open source projects as well as has them more integrated and of course with a nice UI. Uh, we've been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS now for four years. So we actually have four years of experience running Kubernetes in production. So we realized that a lot of people actually wanted to help with that part and they wanted our expertise. So we are in the process of uh, productizing the Kubernetes layer that uh, we had created to um, put Weave Cloud on AWS. Uh, and we're, since GitOps has become such a core part of our methodology, we're making it a GitOps aware enterprise uh, platform. So if anybody's interested in, you know, getting help or getting started on their Kubernetes journey, you're interested in this kind of platform, maybe you have on-premises needs, uh, definitely uh, hit me up and let me know if you want more information. And of course, when we provide this um, product to people, uh, a lot of times it comes with consulting and training and support that people need to make sure that the platform is installed well and is maintained well. So if you haven't heard of us, this is your first time, well, welcome. Our website is weave.works. So thanks for listening to the intro and let me know if you have any questions. 
So a little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, we're very lucky to have Adrian Mouat from um, Container Solutions. He's a chief scientist there that um, if you know Container Solutions, they have um, uh, professional services as well as products. So he's sort of like the chief scientist for the uh, innovations and the product side. So we're really lucky to have him as a knowledge person and a Docker captain here to uh, share his expertise in this area. Uh, if you've been here before, you know that these sessions last between about 30 to 45 minutes usually. So they can be as short as 30, and that concludes the talk, and the Q&A um, usually ends around 45. Um, if they are just a huge amount of questions, sometimes we will go over, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes, but it's usually about 45 minutes. The platform that we're using is Zoom. So hopefully um, you have been able to find the chat button, because that will be the way that you'll ask questions. Uh, if you can't see it, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and helps you see a little bit more of the dashboard for Zoom. So hopefully you can find uh, that that way. And a reminder, when you do start chatting, make sure that the to drop down is selected to everyone. Otherwise, the questions only come to us panelists, which means people can't see your questions. And sometimes people help each other with answers and uh, other people can't see your answers if it just comes to us. So please make sure you set that up before you start chatting. So with that, I will hand it over to Adrian. Hi, there. Thank, um, thanks, Tamar. Um, OK, I guess I'll just get started. Oh, hang on. I need to wait for that. Um, do I, you need to stop sharing so I can share my slides? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna give a presentation on advanced techniques for building container images. Um, it's basically, 90% of this talk is about BuildX, uh, which is the new uh, build tool and, and newer versions of Docker. Um, to give a little bit of context, um, um, I think you're probably all aware that Docker's slogan or is build chip run, or I think it's build chip run any app anywhere at the minute. And I sort of feel that in, in recent times, um, stuff has become, oh, I should check you can all hear me. Hang on. Yeah. Yep, I can hear you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I thought I'd double check before I continued. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so. Although now you have your little chat box covering up your slide. Oh, really? I didn't know you could see that. Well, now you can see all kinds of um, Zoom. <laughs> oh, really? Zoom I thought I just shared this window. Uh, yes, but the, it's the Zoom. Anything on top of that window? Yes, it's just the Zoom, your Zoom. Uh, okay, <laughs> never mind, that's, that's very much housekeeping, but I'm glad you told me. Um, can we close them out? Oh, I've got, it, can you still see it? Because I can no longer see it. Okay, I see. Why don't we unshare and reshare? Because otherwise your um, oh. Zoom, there you go, yeah, let's try again. Okay, I won't click, I won't press Alt Tab ever again. <laughs> right. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Oh, now going forward. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I kind of feel like in recent years, we've we focused a lot more on orchestration and deployment, especially with Kubernetes and all the complexity that went along with that. And I think it deprived sort of the, the build part, which is where we really started a little bit of oxygen. But in the last sort of, a couple of releases of, of Docker, I think we, we've actually seen a bit of a, a move back towards looking at, at the build side of things. Um, and yeah, and that really came to the fruition with BuildKit. Uh, I've come up with this term called container native development. Um, and basically all I'm talking about here is instead of you know, doing go build or whatever, do using Docker build. Uh, to run our compilers and our actual language instead of having to install a sort of whole language tooling for Go or Haskell or whatever you program in locally. Um, and where I'm coming from is when I first started with containers, um, I was a Python developer at the time, uh, and my first use for Docker was really to replace VirtualEnd. So if you're a Python developer at all, you'll know VirtualEnd, but basically it was a very sort of lightweight form of virtualization that allowed you to have multiple Python projects on the go at the same time, and they could use different versions of the Python compiler and different versions of packages inside. Uh, now Python actually works really well if you use it in a Docker build environment. So what I mean here is I didn't 
we're not installing Python on the host at all or, or, or on our development machine at all. Uh, we're just using Python inside a Docker container. Uh, and then we're using Docker build and Docker run. Uh, and that works really well in the example of Python because what you can do is bind the code that you're working on as a volume. So what I would have is like a, a web app running inside a Docker container that had my Python code inside it. And when I was editing code locally, that was immediately reflected inside the, the running container. Uh, and as well as uh, not, not slowing me down in development at all, it also gave me sort of a portable and reproducible artifact that I could share with others, uh, and they would have exactly the same experience as I did and cut down on the number of things that could go wrong. Now, uh, you know, I used that, I, I wrote this book called, called Using Docker, and I very much uh, used that kind of same system in that book. Uh, and I kind of got away with it because I used Python. But the problem is if you try and extend that same approach to something like Go, it doesn't really work as well. You do get, still get a bunch of advantages in that you don't have to install the Go tooling uh, and you get the same sort of consistent environment and it makes things easy for end users. So if I want to get started with a, with a new project, I can just uh, run the Docker file um, and start making changes to it without having to install the correct packages and uh, the correct version of Go, et cetera. But the major disadvantage and the reason that no serious developer would do it for any length of time, is just that it's gonna be slower, right? If I'm running Docker build by nature, it's gonna, it does more, so it's gonna be slower than Go build. But um, it used to be at least considerably slower. Um, and there was, and that was you know, the, the major problem, but there, was, there used to be some other problems that were also um, pointed at, at Docker build. One of them was the simplistic caching model. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume you're roughly aware of how Docker works and how the sort of caching model uh, works. Uh, another thing is people complained a lot that requires root. Now, this isn't too important in the development, development machine, but it did become uh, a lot more relevant when we're using like, a cluster to build our Docker images because we don't want you know, the user in that cluster to be root. As it's, a, it's a security problem, really. Um, uh, secrets. So if you wanted to clone uh, a Git repo uh, you'd, uh, and you wanted to use your own SSH key for that, uh, you didn't really want to do that in the Docker file because typically you would leak uh, your credentials into the Docker image, which is not a good thing. Uh, and similarly, if you wanted to like, download some from, say, uh, an S3 bucket, for example. Um, also, quite early on in the sort of lifetime of Docker, Docker actually stopped um, allowing submissions for new changes to the Docker file syntax because they simply got overwhelmed with all suggestions. Um, and that kind of, that lasted for a long time uh, and effectively until sort of the end of last year when uh, the, the entire backend was rewritten for the Docker build stuff and there's something called build kit. Um, and build kit um, is a really clever piece of tech. Um, I kind of feel it's not got as much uh, limelight as it should have, because it is, it is quite, uh, it really is quite impressive. Um, it is still a, a server, a client server model. So we still do have this idea of like uh, zipping up, the, well, not even zipping, but transferring the, the current um, build context over, the, over a socket to the server. So there's still the idea of like, send, still idea of clients and servers, which some people don't like, but because build kit is a separate library, you can kind of do what you like with it. And so most of you have probably heard of Jessie Frazzle. She actually wrote something called IMG or Image, uh, and that's basically a standalone version of, of build kit that you can run without the client server model. Uh, I did try it in my testing. Um, it does work. For some reason, it seems to be running a, a good bit slower than, than Docker build, but um, definitely take a look if you're interested in it. Um, the sort of biggest change with build kit, it's got this idea of an intermediate representation called LLB or low level, low level builder. And basically it's a sort of intermediate format uh, for the compiler. So you think about it, Docker files are really source code. Um, an idea of LLB is we can have an intermediate format that's something like LLV, LLVM IR, if you, if you know what that is, or LLVM intermediate representation. Um, if you're not really aware of that, 
you, you can also think of it similar to like Java bytecode or .NET CIL. So you know, you've got your Java source code, which gets compiled into your Java bytecode, which can then be run on a variety, variety of platforms and, and you know, eventually compiled into assembly. Uh, and similar with .NET CIL. Uh, so it's very much the idea of this intermediate representation, but the inter but interesting thing is not only does that sort of divorce us from the, the source code or Docker file, but it also forms this graph rather than a simple chain. So in sort of this, the Docker file terms, you know, everything proceeds sort of, I'm not sure you can see my pointer, but everything proceeds like top down. So we can have, you know, from the top step to, to the step below to the step below, and there's no parallelism at all or even possible in this model. But in the sort of LLB model, we can add parallelism because we now can explicitly state our dependencies. So um, I'm not sure how well the slide comes across. Um, I can't this is it. it's really small. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't really want to focus on the details of it anyway. I just want to try and get across the idea that there is um, parallel steps, if you like. So that like the third step down but below that, we have three steps that can happen in parallel because they don't have dependencies on each other, if you like. And because of that, we can you know take advantage of the parallelism and things can, can happen concurrently and therefore complete faster. Okay, so that's the, the major idea behind using LLB. But the next thing we've got to think about is front ends. And front ends are basically, you know, the source code that compiles down to the LLB that Docker build understands and can turn in to a, a Docker image. Uh, understandably, there is a Docker file front end, so we can use our, our, our familiar Docker file syntax, but you can create your own front ends for any sort of tool chain. So examples that have been done so far is like additions, Sort of custom additions to Dockerfile syntax and something called Mockerfile. There's also something called Gockerfile that creates a very simple Go, sim go web app uh, system. Um, and you can think of more. Of, I think Build Packs was another one that's been done. Um, but to be honest, there still isn't really that many mature front ends. Uh, and that's a shame because that's, it's kind of essential uh, that we, we start seeing some new front ends if we're going to exploit. Uh, the parallelism and, and take advantage of, of the, the new build kit possibilities. Um, some other things that came out in build kit, uh, there's a bunch of new mount options, um, and I'll, I'll show these in the demo uh, and go into a little bit more detail later. There's output formats, um, so we can get things other than a Docker image out of, uh, out of build kit, and that makes sense when you think about it, because I could have a Docker image that you know, contains a compiler or perhaps contains something like LaTeX, uh, and I could have a PDF, for example, as the final output or, or an executable binary, et cetera, rather than a Docker image. Uh, distribut distributable workers. So I can now have multiple sort of workers for my Docker builds. Um, cross compilation, so it's become a lot easier to target different architectures um, from a development machine or uh, a CICD tool chain. Um, rootless execution, so you no longer have to be root to build um, Docker images. Uh, and finally, there's something that I'll get to at the end, hopefully called a uh, bake, which is basically a, a form of make for, for Docker files. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a sort of quick demo. Uh, and going back to what I was talking about a minute ago, I kind of wanted to see how much slower Go or how much faster Go build is compared to Docker build. Um, with a new build kit tooling. Um, and for this example, just for the sake of, uh, you know, I'm not a, a Go developer by day, so I had to find a sort of medium-sized uh, Go project to test this on, uh, and so I just happened across the Run C project. And Run C, as you might be aware, is basically sort of the very heart of Docker. It's like, um, it's a container runtime, but with everything sort of stripped down. So there's no sort of, uh, there's no sort of, um, fancy networking support, there's no overlay file systems, there's nothing like that. It's very sort of the, just the simplest, simplest heart of a container runtime you can get. Okay, so now I'm gonna to have to unshare and share my terminal. Let's hope this works. I hope we get this right. I hope it's our terminal. That looks good. Can you see my terminal? Yep. That's a good start. Okay, so 
I'm in the Go source code for this Run C project. I type ls, make clean. Oh, and I'll also, as you might be aware, Go has a build cache. So if I do Go clean dash cache, is it? Oh, can I also? I hope this doesn't break everything. Okay. Um, so if we start with Go build and we make the project from uh, you know completely empty cache and we time it. It's probably going to take somewhere around, I think it took me a little bit over 10 seconds last time. Oh, it's taking longer this time. That's maybe because we're running uh, Zoom. Almost a worrying wait less. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, that took 28 seconds. I think Zoom's uh, maybe taking a lot of the CPU. Um, okay. So if I do change something in this file, um, now this time I'm going to have a warm cache. So if I do time make again, I think this is going to ruin my timings. But anyway, so that's taking about four seconds. So there's obviously a huge difference when we've got a, a sort of warm cache. Okay, so let's change to my sort of Dockerized version. So this is exactly the same project. Um, do I make clean for the sake of it? I don't think there's anything there. And the Run C project does include a Docker file. And this Docker file includes all the dependencies you need to build Go, um, build Go, build Run C. But it also includes some stuff for like testing Run C containers and creating a nice sort of temporary work environment for doing various things in. I didn't really want all that. I just wanted um, a simplified version with the dependencies um, and then just build in the code. So I kind of stripped out a lot of that into this simpler version called dockerfile.1. Okay. Um, so for this purpose of this demo, I'm running 19, I'm running Docker version 1903.2. Um, it is a community edition. I do have experimental true on. Um, so for build kit, I don't believe that's relevant. At the end, I'll be talking about the build x subcommand. And I think you need experimental true on for that. Or an experimental build, whatever, however you like to explain it. Um, okay, so to turn build kit on, what we do is set the build kit variable. So you can see it's on at the minute. And um, just for the sake of this um, demo, I'm going to temporarily turn it off. Um, I hope this doesn't take too long. Um, and then let's try building that Docker file I just showed you. And is this the weave user group? Save Docker file dot one dot. Let's hope I got that right. So unfortunately, I think this is probably going to hang for 30 seconds again. Um, Someone is wondering uh, if you're using a Chromebook. It's not a Chromebook. It is a, it is a Linux laptop. Mm. But yeah, Zoom does not seem happy on it. Yes. Uh, Zoom and I don't think it built Linux well for Zoom. Oh, sorry, Zoom well for Linux. Sorry. Oh, well, but that, okay. So it actually it kind of works out quite interestingly because um, the build inside Docker only took, what, three point, oh, maybe about five seconds longer, which as a percentage probably isn't that much. Um, but the big thing here is if you were, you know, using Docker build all the time instead of Go build, there's no way you're going to want to wait 33 seconds to build each time. Um, when I was running this without Zoom, I think it took... Um, like 12 seconds or something and 10 seconds for the go build. So I was consistently losing two or three seconds. Um, even from, uh, and compared to like a, a go build with, with a, a warm cache, you know, I'm losing what 30 seconds here. Uh, and I think from my previous test, I lost, um, you know, I, I, it was still the 10, 12 seconds. Okay. So that's um, with 
Billkit off. Let's turn on Billkit and let's just run exactly the same thing and see what happens. Now this, yeah, I probably should change something. Maybe this is a bad idea, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Um, so I've changed something, um, which will invalidate the Docker build cache. Um, and I'll do that entire build again, which I'm afraid will probably take 30 seconds. But um, I did want to, to point, out, point out a couple of things about the, the differences in the UI. So it is a, a fancy new UI that's um, resized itself as appropriate to the size of your terminal, um, which I actually quite appreciate because um, Docker was never very good with uh, keeping in 80 characters or anything. Um, and it does give you timings for each sort of little part of it. So we can see here, like, you know, this, I've lost 0.1 of a second loading build definition, uh, 0.1 of a second transferring over the build context, um, and 0.3 of a second copying those files in. Um, the make all took roughly the same time as, um, as the version, that's the, the straight go build which, well, it took me, me two seconds or one or two seconds slower. Um, and I do find it is actually reliably one or two seconds slower. I actually thought it might be slower here. I think that's because of the overlay file system. So I believe if you had like a, a pure CPU um, process going on here that wasn't hitting the file system, you get basically exactly the same time on the host and in this container. Um, we've also lost 0.9 of a second exporting the image. So you know, there's like just over a second to two seconds of Dockery stuff going on that going on that, that have cost us time and this step seems slightly slower as well. Okay, um, so turning on Docker build, build kit, I don't think it really saved as much time. Okay, maybe it saves a, couple, a second or so, but I, I don't know how repeatable that is. Um, okay, so. The next thing I want to try is, if I edit this file again first, just so we're not, this time, oh, I might have to run this twice. Yeah, okay. So I also have um, this dockerfile.2, uh, and this is using the new build kit um, dockerfile stuff. So I said the, the one of the first things you'll notice is uh, that I've got the syntax line at the top, and here we're saying we're gonna use the new dockerfile syntax. Um, this is how you tell Docker which front end to use to compile down to, to LLB. Um, so I could use, you know, and as you, you can probably guess this refers to like a, an image on the, the Docker Hub. You can give it whatever image you like, as long as it can use that to compile the LLB. So that's how you define your own front end for your own sort of projects. Um, and what I've done here is I've taken out this make all and I've replaced it with this mount line. So it is still doing make all at the end, but I've also got this mount type equals cache target equal is root cache go build. Um, and so what that's doing is, say, is telling it to create basically a cache volume uh, at this directory in the container. Um, and I'm not saying anything about the host at all. So it's, it's entirely taking care of this itself. It's all um, internal to Docker. There is actually a bind mount type that can tell you, to, that will tell it to, to bind something from the build context, but that's not what we're doing here. It is just a cache that um, Docker manages in, inside a volume by itself, uh, and it figures out when it can reuse this sort of cache volume in a Go build, in a Docker build, sorry. Um, there's also something about output, but we'll, I'll come to that later. So that's our new Docker file. Let's try building it. Oh. Oh. Okay, so with a warm cache, it's taken us somewhere about um, 10 seconds. Uh, and that part cost, took us about 7.5 seconds. Um, again, when I've been testing before, it took reliably like a, a second or two more than uh, the Go build. 
Um, it seems to have taken slightly longer this time, um, possibly because of Zoom, I'm not quite sure. Um, but that is a lot faster than, uh, than the version without the cache. Like, we've, we've, you know, that's a third of the time. So that's a big speed up. Uh, and we're getting much closer to, to the time for the, the actual Go build, although we're still a little bit off. Oh, for a Go build with a warm cache. Okay. Um, there is one other thing I want to show you, and that's another feature um, that's new in um, that's new in BuildKit. Uh, and we're using like a multi-stage build here. Multi-stage build has been around for a little while. Um, if you've not used it before, basically you can name your build steps. So here I've called this first build step builder, and that's going to create a builder image. And then here we've got a second build step, um, which starts from a scratch image, which as you're probably aware, it's like a completely empty file system, so there's nothing in it at all. I'm calling that step our output image, um, and then from the builder image, I'm copying the run C binary over. Uh, and so what I'm going to end up with here is an image with nothing in it except run C. Uh, and now you, um, you probably have a very good question as to why that's useful, and the reason is that I can use it to um, alongside this dash dash output flag. So we're doing ls, 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 you'll see there's no run C here. So what I've been comparing so far hasn't really been a fair comparison because when I did the go build, well, I got the run C binary out. But when I'm doing the Docker build, I've got a couple of images that contain the run C binary, but I don't have any run C binary in my local directory. So what you can do now is, uh, with new versions of Docker, is this Docker build, Dash dash output. Oh, geez, this is complicated. Let's hope I type this right. Type is equal to local. Destination is going to be the current directory. We're still going to call it run C. This group. And it has to be a Docker file. Dot two current directory. Let's hope I type that right, and then I will explain it. Okay, and it's been able to use the build cache here. So everything happened pretty instantly. And it has copied a file out. So if I type ls, you see one C is there. And it works. So that's pretty cool. Um, and why it's pretty cool is because if you wanted to do this before, um, you would have had to like, uh, you know, if you wanted to use an image as a, to build like a C binary, a Go binary, or a PDF or something, you'd have ended up having to do uh, a Docker run at some point, or Docker create, to create an image that you could then copy the built artifact out of. Um, but with this dash dash output, we never actually need to do anything other than build the image. So we don't need to, to have a useless run step with a, with a volume or use Docker CP or something like that. So it saves us a little bit of work having this dash dash output. Um, it is a slightly, it does work in a slightly confusing way, unfortunately. Um, so type local, so we're telling it we want to, to save out to local file system and the current directory. That's fair enough, but how do you know what you're getting out? Um, I'm still not exactly <laughs> sure, but basically um, it's the output of the last image. So in this case, you know, it's just run C because that's all that there is in that image. But I'm not quite sure what you would get if this, instead of from scratch, I had from Debian. Would you get the whole Debian file system or do you just get the differences? I've not actually um, tested that properly yet. But anyway, it does give you a much easier way to copy uh, built artifacts out of images without running containers. Okay, so back to the slides. Oh, do I need to stop for questions or anything? Um, well, while you're switching over, if anybody wants to throw in any questions in the chat, you are welcome to do so. But so far, we haven't had any during the talk. Okay, no problem. So um, the question is, is Docker build close enough in speed to, to go build that you consider using it? Um, I think the answer is probably maybe, uh, as in... If you have a, a Docker project, if you're like looking at a new sort of Go project or something, it's probably fast enough that you could use Docker build um, to maybe you know change a few variables and play with a, a project, um, submit a simple patch. 
uh, without getting annoyed. But if you're doing anything for a long time, you, you're probably still going to want to revert to your, to your Go Build tooling just to um, save a couple of seconds. Um, and there is a bit of a, uh, an elephant I've not mentioned, which is, of course, IDEs. I guess a lot of us use IDEs to build our stuff these days. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really a Go developer, so it's just. I think a lot of Go developers are still sort of Vim and Emacs people, but a lot of the rest of us use IDEs, especially for like Java, um, Rust, C Sharp, etc. And these all have incremental compilation now, which is a, a great saving grace. It's constantly compiling while you're using it, um, and you're definitely not going to want to lose that in order to, to use uh, a container. Um, However, I do kind of wonder if IDEs could use containers. Uh, and I brought this up, you know, I brought this question up uh, uh, when I gave a, a similar version of this talk previously. And somebody told me Eclipse Shea apparently does, does something similar where you can save um, you know, your project into a container and share it with other people. Um, but anyway, that was really just a, a thought exercise rather than a um, hard facts. Okay, so what other new stuff is there in BuildKit? Um, so mount options, you've seen the cache mount option, which is really handy. It can seriously speed up your Docker builds. Um, there's also the bind option, which allows you to bind a volume from the build context into, um, into the build container. There's tempfs, which um, potentially could speed up some operations as well, as it basically gives you an in-memory volume. Um, there's also secret and SSH. Uh, and these are great because now we can use secret or sensitive data, sensitive data, written, sensitive data to be used, but not without leaking it into the final image. Um, this does require similar to dash dash output. You do need to use build arguments uh, as well as Docker file changes to get this to work. Um, I've got an example here. Um, so we have mount type is secret, um, ID AWS, and we're going to save the um, the AWS credentials into this container while we do uh, S3 CP. And, you know, when I do it at the Docker build time, I also have to tell it where to get this um, AWS secret from locally. Um, there's also an interesting argument called cache from, and that allows you to load the cache from an existing image. So in the previous example, where um, I did a Docker build, then I had that cache. I could uh, save the cache into image, upload it to a Docker registry, then somebody else could pull it and reuse that cache to build an image. Um, I'm not sure how useful this is uh, in practice. Um, there is a, a link here, and I'll, sh and I'll share the slide somehow with you later. Um, and that's from, if you follow that link, it's, a, a, it's an ASCII cinema cast by, by Tonus, who's the main developer on BuildKit. Um, and he shows how to use that. And it's, yeah, uh, maybe in some specialist applications, it, it could seriously save you a lot of time. Um, I'm not really sure how useful it is day to day, but it's certainly an interesting idea. And that brings us on to BuildX. So BuildX is an experimental plugin for Docker. Um, it's just effectively a separate binary. So it gives you a standalone version of BuildKit that you call Docker BuildX, and it basically calls out the BuildKit binary. Uh, and that gives us some of the, the other features I was talking about, such as multiple builder instances um, and some new commands. So if you docker build x dash dash help, you see the new commands. Um, yeah, and if I do docker build x ls, I can see my builder instances. So generally, you, you know, you're going to have your docker, normal docker build instance here, but you can also have build kit instances you can target. And these can also support various platforms. So I could have a separate builder instance for various platforms, potentially running on, on architecture. Um, you know, so I could have like a, you know, an ARM server to do my ARM builds, an Intel server to do my Intel builds. Um, but it's not distributed builds. So it's not the case that I have five build servers and I run my Docker build and it runs on them all simultaneously. Um, that's not what happens. Um, but, you know, I do Docker build, it runs on one instance. But uh, the exception is if I want to build for multiple platforms, the builds for separate platforms can occur on separate builder instances. But it's not one build across multiple instances. 
Um, it's now pretty easy to do um, a multi-platform build so if everything's set up correctly. Um, if you do Docker build and dash dash platform, uh, that should just work uh, with a big assumption that your base images support the various platforms. So there has to be a build of your base image for the, for the correct platform. Um, if you do this locally and everything's set up correctly and you've got QMU installed, it'll use that to like uh, uh, create the image for, set for different platforms within any host. Um, yeah, or you can target different builder instances, as I mentioned previously. Uh, finally, it's also possible to use language tooling. So I could um, have a Docker file that has a, uses Go to cross-compile a binary and then copy that binary into a base image for a different architecture and that, for, well, a base image for the same architecture as the binary built, which may be different from the host you're building on if you follow. Uh, and that should work. Um, concurrent builds, yeah. So going back to what we were saying earlier of the diagrams and so on to exploit the parallelism in LB, uh, you do really require more intelligent front ends. With Docker file builds, the only time you can get parallelism is when you have multi-stage builds that, that don't have dependencies, uh, which is a bit disappointing. Uh, bake. So I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how many of the people on the call. Um, uh, people tend to like love make or hate make. Uh, and personally, I'm not a big fan of make. I'm not sure where the people on this call sit. Um, but definitely shell scripts and make files are, are very common when using Docker. Um, and one problem is when you call Docker build from make, you generally end up with like a, a sequence, right? You call you Docker build one image, you Docker build another image, you Docker build a third image, but it doesn't all happen at the same time, even though there's not really any reason why it shouldn't. So for that reason, and probably presumably because they're not big fans of make either, um, we have bake. So you can do Docker build x bake, and you can give it a Docker compose file, or you can give it a bake file as we see here. Uh, and we've, Basically, it's, you know, it's reasonably straightforward. We can define what targets we have, uh, which are pretty flexible. We can tell it for each target, we can give it a Docker file to build from, and what to tag it as, and what platforms to build it for. Um, yeah, and you can do things like uh, you know, run tests in a container, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm quite curious to see where, where bait goes. It is in the experimental build, so it's not entirely clear. What, you, know, you can expect it to change. Uh, considerably before it becomes mainstream. Okay, um, so just to wrap up, um, the way we are deploying one software has, you know, has changed a lot. Um, we're now talking about using microservices, running on Kubernetes, possibly using Istio or Linkerd, and we have to think about observability and how we expose metrics in our apps. And this has all had an effect on how we develop software. But arguably, the tools that we use to develop software are still kind of catching up. Um, and I think we, whilst they have changed, they still have further to go. Um, and when I was writing the slides, I was you know, thinking at the, start of, at the start of this presentation, I had sort of that container native build where we're doing things in Docker build. Um, and that still has a, you know, a lot of mileage left. And I would like to see like more LLB front ends, more IDE integration, et cetera. But I think we're also starting to see something that I've decided to call cluster native um, building or development, uh, whereby we actually have a Kubernetes cluster just for development purposes. Um, and, and people still try to run these on the like, development machines, but I suspect we're actually better off running them uh, in the cloud uh, somewhere. Uh, and this tooling like Tilt um, from Windmill Engineering, was it? Um, Scaffold, is that the... Scaffolding draft, one of them is Microsoft and one of them is Google. <laughs> I can't actually remember which is which. But they, they're both this idea that we can try to let us develop locally on our machines, but have the changes immediately picked up by a Kubernetes cluster that we use for development. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big thing going, going forward. Um, taking it even further, there's something called Darklang that I, that I find really fascinating. Uh, and Darklang has um, you know, everything from like the programming language um, is designed to target, you know, you, you're running instances uh, and everything is done through feature flags, et cetera. But, uh, you know, that's uh, taking it to a completely new level. Um, okay, uh, I think that's 
pretty much me. Hopefully, we've got some time for questions. Um, I will see how we can share these slides afterwards. Um, I do have some uh, have references here for people that are interested in more information. The best place is like uh, Tonus's uh, and Matt's talks on this, uh, but they do go into a lot more detail, so they're quite um, tech heavy. Believe it or not, this was a, a much more high level talk. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, our first question is um, sort of kind of in this narrative that you tell, where do you see user space builders fitting in? And they gave the example of Conico. Oh, Conico, the, the, the Google build tool? Um, actually, Conico is new to me, but this is the question that got posted um, by so, user space builder. It says yes. But, I mean, oh, I see what you mean for user space. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, people, I've had a lot of complaints about Canico. Um, I think you may well see like something similar to Canico based on top of BuildKit uh, for you. I've not really looked into, I mean, we're, we're entirely talking about rootless execution here. So the problem with the old Docker build system is you effectively had to give something root to build, which is a bit of a nightmare for a cluster. So when they're talking about user namespace here, they're talking about, you know, we want it to run on the cluster as a user who is not root. Um, yeah, and absolutely. Um, I've not gone too much into details uh, of that. I suspect you will start seeing some nicer solutions for that soon. Okay. Yeah, the person asking a question said that they're looking to bake image building and security into the cluster. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Everybody's, I, I didn't talk about it in this presentation, but definitely like your CI CD pipeline really ties into all this. Um, and I, you know, I briefly mentioned Darklan, and, and one of the things with Darklan was trying to really simplify all that and pull out a bunch of steps. Um, but yeah, in your CI/CD system, you're going to have to build the images somehow, and we would much rather um, build them without uh, being root and so on. Um, whether or not you use Docker build or you use something else built on build kit. Uh, a lot of people are using the Google tool and, and not just Canico, there's also the Basil um, that can also build container images. Uh, and one of the really nice things with Basil is it's also entirely reproducible. So if I do two Basil builds, I can end up with binary, I will end up with binary exact um, replicas of the, of the same thing, which is not the case with Docker build because you have timestamps um, and a few other, few other things that mean things are not reproducible yes. at a binary level. In fact, we had... I'm not um, sure that answers the question. It probably raises more questions. <laughs> we, in fact, had uh, Chris Love speaking a couple of weeks ago. So if anybody's interested, uh, it's on our YouTube channel where he gave a presentation on Basil. And I think he intends to return to give a part two for that. So hopefully oh, that's okay. helpful. Um, yes. And then... Um, this person, so the previous person was asking the question said, so the baking the image, uh, using bake to in, it do image building security seems to be working quite well for them, touch wood. And then um, is it build age as well? Um, so let me see, I'm putting it in chat. I'll hopefully it won't yeah. break everything. <laughs> so. Uh, I suppose I could stop sharing actually. Yes. Yeah, well I stopped sharing, hang on. Yeah, if you stop sharing, see. hopefully you can see the chat box. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and while we're doing this, are there any other questions? Uh, so Lee from our team, actually, I guess he's listening in and shared a link to the rootless build kit. And oh, Builder, yeah. Yeah, so Builder's a Red Hat one. I've not played with that too much either, but it's all, it's all quite interesting. Um, I think build kit is is hopefully going to, I think you'll see a lot of um, different um, projects using build kit. So stuff like image or IMG, I'm not quite sure it's pronounced by Jesse and, and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, cool. So we're getting close to the hour. So please, if you still have questions, you're welcome to put it in the chat. But in the meantime, I will share my slides to let you know of future talks that are coming up. Hopefully you can see this. So as I mentioned, Stacy, our community manager is online and she has been busy, busy, busy. You can see our calendar coming up. Um, uh, pretty much, I think, yes, all of our Tuesdays. Uh, we've got a variety of uh, topics here. Hopefully you'll come and join us. If anybody's in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, we have a meetup with uh, Lee Capilli, the one who just shared the notes. Uh, he'll be in town from Colorado. So we'll be uh, doing a meetup with him 
Um, and Lockie from Microsoft will be talking about Helms 3 and with uh, somebody from solo.io who'll be talking about service meshes. So if you're in San Francisco, then uh, please make sure to join us. We have our San Francisco Weave um, meetup group. So if you can't find it anyway, uh, you'll get an email after this with my email address. You're free to reach out to me to make sure you don't miss it. Um, we should also mention that that day, the reason uh, he's in town is he'll be doing a Twitch uh, presentation at noon San Francisco time. We are still waiting to get the information for that, so it's not posted here. But uh, if you're interested in joining our Twitch presentation, he'll be talking about GitOps as well. So we'll share more information about that. So with that, let me just double check here if there's anything new on the chat otherwise. Um, okay, so yes, we have a question. Uh, when can we insert a secret for accessing AWS? Sometimes I have multiple secrets and I would like to switch them. How can I switch? Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but he, that, that Docker build, so you're basically in your Docker file won't change, but like there's a Docker build argument for saying which credential you want to use. So that should work fine. Just like, uh, you know, you, in the Docker build step, you'll specify which, which credential you want to use. So I hope that helps. Uh, if not, you can clarify your question a little bit more. Uh, thanks. Okay, looks like we answered the question. Um, and then Lee's also adding, also you could try build X bake. <laughs> I guess that's an agreement. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I've, I have to say I've not played with bake very much. I was just quite, quite interested. So I might try adding it to my current project. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I'll close out here. Hopefully you can see my slide. Uh, as I mentioned, um, a lot of what we do is around this concept of GitOps. Um, if any of you are interested in our ebook, we have an ebook, uh, a guide to GitOps. So we have the link here and we'll follow up with that. Uh, if you're new to us, uh, thanks for joining. And uh, we have our Slack channel. So that's definitely a place you can meet our engineers, our team um, in developer experience. And if there's anything that comes to mind from this presentation that you'd like to follow up on, you can definitely ask there. And then, um, uh, Adrian, you had uh, contact information that we can probably share in the follow-up email for people who want to contact you about this talk. Uh, okay. Again, uh, we have this crazy calendar coming up that Stacey's worked on. Uh, you check out our meetup page, which is our single source of truth. It's the best place to get the latest, greatest calendar on all of our online and in-person talks. It's the Weave user group. So again, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for joining us. We're really lucky to have a great speaker like you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks everybody for joining and for your fantastic questions. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.